Um, at this point, I'd like to open up the floor to some questions for our panel. Well, we uh, start things off here. Um, we've, we've talked today um, about the need for achieving, uh, achieving sustainability in our society. Uh, and there's a number of countries in Europe that prohibit the use of landfills as a primary disposal option, um, but claim very high diversion rates. Uh, just wanted to, uh, to get to hear from the panel in terms of some of their diverse experience. Is that the direction that the answer should be going? Should we be looking at uh, a better model or solution in, in terms of that? Should we look to them for inspiration? What? Can you repeat that, the, the last part? In, in terms of looking at uh, the European model where they have prohibited landfills as a primary disposal option in terms of trying to um, integrate resource recovery, um, is that the place to start in terms of getting society to, to shift towards uh, kind of greater acceptance of resource recovery? W what needs to be the trigger to, uh, to encourage kind of greater uh, kind of journey down this resource recovery road? It's, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a mixed bag there because um, we have this debate actually with the, with the music industry. There's one venue that's that sends all of their waste to incineration, and it makes things a lot easier because then you don't have to, you don't have to deal with fans that are have had a few too many beers and can't really figure out which is the recycling bin and which is the compost bin and which is the, the garbage. So we get a lot of cross contamination. So when everything is um, off to incineration, we don't have to worry about proper proper sorting. But it doesn't it doesn't reinforce that behavior of, um, of needing to think about whether something can be recycled or reused. But I'm, in, in other ways, I'm, I'm not against the, using incineration as a way to capture energy from, from waste as well, if it's, they use proper air scrubbers and so forth. Yeah, I, I would echo that. And I, I think contextually, you, you kind of have to look at, at which country you're at and even which city. So for example, Sweden, there's an incinerator manufacturer in Sweden, so lo and behold, there's more incineration in Sweden. Um, because the company puts pressure on the government to say we should have incineration. Um, there's, Germany has banned organics, um, which makes some sense. Um, perhaps a, another way of looking at it is from an from energy perspective. So everybody lauds Germany for saying, hey, we're going we're gonna to stop nuclear energy after Fukushima, which was probably a good idea. But what ended up happening was they bought electricity from Poland that was generated from a nuclear facility that Poland kept running, which was older than the one that was closed in Germany. So there's a lot of these perverse incentives and, and bans are very, very powerful, but they need to be looked at carefully. Um, and I, before banning anything, I, I, I would argue for having very clear, uh, at least in the policy makers, um, awareness what's happening and, and how it's being measured um, because there will always be some sort of unintended consequence from a ban and it's a good idea to, to be able to measure that as it happens. Yeah, I, I just to, to echo that, I think that's, that's absolutely right. I mean, we, you know, obviously we don't want to see, you know, plastics industry doesn't want to see any of that material end up in landfill. We know the inner energy in that material, so if it can't be recycled, we know it can be used. Um, there's another way to get that energy from the from that um, from that item, um, but we've also seen, you know, especially with you know bag bans, we we've, we've seen um, you know unintended negative consequences. So we would really, it, it's unfortunately there is no silver bullet. There's no you know one one solution. So I think it's it's multifaceted. Yeah. Yeah. Dan, you've been around the world, and we heard John Coyne talk about technology in other parts of the world. Uh, Sarah's talked about uh, being able to sort flexibles in films. Uh, we've heard about marketing. But where does culture enter into it? Because I, I was talking to someone about dealing with plastics in another part of the world, and they said, well, Joe, it's not going to work because they just throw it on the ground. It's not going to get to where it should be. So. Do we need a homogenized culture around the world to make it work, or is it act locally and?
figure out how people think and work and all that. Uh, I, I, I mean, what have you seen that would be challenging to take what we learned here or even the uh, materials of the future project and move it elsewhere in the world because we're trying to combat marine litter in other parts of the world where it's coming from eight to 14 countries, not here where we have sophisticated exactly. systems. So what's your feeling on it? Because you, you have unique experience no a lot of people in this room do not have. Uh, culture, I mean, culture is probably, if not the most important driving factor, one of them for solid waste. And where I see this sort of manifest quite well is Japan and Canada have roughly the same per capita GDP and, and roughly the same kind of uh, environmental awareness where we are as countries. And per capita Canadians generate twice as much solid waste as, as, as someone in Japan. Now, having said that, so if we're, if we're only interested in solid waste, we're going to go to Japan and say, what can we borrow from them culturally? On the other hand, Japan probably single-handedly is going to bring the bluefin tuna to extinction. So you have to be careful. You know, culture is always a, a bit of a double-edged sword. I think that culture actually is one of those things that, that you use um, so, for example, I mentioned that I, I started the Blue Box program in, in Guelph. City of Guelph, probably still to this day, they would, uh, Peterborough will argue that they could give them a run for their money, but is probably the most environmentally aware community in Ontario, if not Canada. And it's, it's a quirk of, of how it's structured. There was only one level of government, it wasn't regionalized. And you could actually use the culture of Guelphs with the university and all of this to be willing to be the front runner for, for the region or for the country where the, the people in Guelph would say, well, that wasn't all that hard. If we can do it, push us a little bit farther. So I think, I think it's, a, it's a respectful partnership between the public policy, the, the municipality, the industry, and the community. And, and I, I really, I thought that was great about you know how you how you generate this this social awareness and this desire to participate in your program not the 20 percent that part's easier the 12 percent before you hit the chasm it's that 80 percent and i i think that that will be different in every community um on the other hand it's always good to poke and prod and, and sticks and carrots are are always a powerful cultural tool everywhere in i worked in in indonesia and the most powerful thing in Indonesia for solid waste in cities was the Adipura Prize. Because the mayor, who had the cleanest city, but it was only like 1% of the streets that were measured, got to meet the president. And that, that drove solid waste in Indonesia for the last, well, for 20 years. If I could, if I could just add something quickly. Sorry, if I could just add something um, to what, what you were saying. Um, I've done some work with some aid organizations like Doctors Without Borders, and the biggest mistake that is usually made is that we take our, our own attitudes and values and so forth and bring them over to the country that, that we're working in. So I think we have to take the same principles when we're applying it to technology or a new products and services, that we need to get to know the local community and what's going to work for them, who the change agents are and opinion leaders in that community, and what messaging is going to work because um, I've seen, I could tell you stories of just some horrific examples of things gone wrong um, in not understanding the culture, um, the local culture. Even was it, um, recently, I think, uh, didn't Home Depot start in China and now it's, there was something, did it close? Uh, there, was something, there was something related to they just hadn't, I guess they hadn't done the research that, um, that the locals don't really do their own renovations as much as, as like we would do here. And it just, I don't know the reasons behind it, but it seems like a, a, a pretty important thing to, to understand before you go into another country and try to sell your products or services. Uh, Sarah, one of the, uh, the key items of your presentation, obviously, in the material uh, recovery for the future is compost packaging the number one uh, material that, uh, that the industry group is, is focusing on at the moment? Um, is that and for the foreseeable future, are there other looming uh, challenges that uh, that they're they're seeing kind of coming up on the horizon in terms of innovative packaging, causing uh, I guess more challenges in in terms of our recovery facilities? 
Um, you know, that's, uh, to the best of my knowledge, that's not something the research group has discussed. Um, they just, you know, they see flexible plastic packaging as, as really um, the future and, and having, and that will continue to innovate in, you know, different types of resins and, and that sort of thing. So they're, they're really focused on that. Um, they have not discussed, you know, other, other types of packaging. But, you know, again, this, this, this project sprung up because they saw, they saw a need. They saw, you know, that the packaging industry was going towards this, this particular type of package. It wasn't getting recycled. They knew they needed to do something about it. So I think if, you know, you know packaging trends continue to change, that the industry um, will continue to respond. First, I'd, I'd like to uh, congratulate Jennifer on her excellent presentation and, and uh, how thrilled I am as well to hear that uh, someone, some group here at the University of Waterloo is focusing on the social aspects of environment and sustainability and not just on the technical aspects because I don't see a lot of that kind of research going on in Canadian universities and I think we desperately need it. So thank you for your effort. Having said that, I, I'd like to pose perhaps a challenge or a, a comment and seek your response to it. I suggest, and I'm going to pick an easy one rather than a waste management one, which is a difficult one, but when people first hear about an environmental problem, I suggest that they come to it in a fairly neutral kind of way. For example, when people in the United States first heard about climate change, I don't think they said, oh, that's a hoax, I don't believe it, that's a Chinese game, or whatever. I think they heard about it, and it was just one more thing. And it was only as a result of massive public education by economic interests that did not support action on climate change, the coal industry, the Koch brothers, uh, Imperial Oil and SO, et cetera, uh, that people decided, or 51% of the people decided that they didn't believe it. And as a result, the wheels got started in motion towards uh, the US withdrawal of Paris. What can be done to try and balance those debates because I think it's inevitable that the economic interests that want to stop something are likely to put more money into it than those of us who uh, believe that we should be making progress in that area but don't have the big bucks and the big corporations behind us. How, how do we uh, influence things at the very beginning of the public discussion in order to make sure that it becomes more science-based rather than philosophy-based. Yes, I, I think that comes back to if if we knew this this you know the scientific facts would we would we act differently? Um, I'm not sure, but I think as environmentalists traditionally we've taken the wrong approach to messaging. So I, and I think that the anti-climate um, change people are more well versed in in the messages that are in creating messages that are effective for their target group and really trying to get to know their audience i think we we focused on these um, scare tactics and negative framing of messages and so forth so i think we need to um we need to take a more biz business-like approach, I think, in our messaging and, and getting to know the different segments. And, and I, I think really understanding that, that people aren't motivated, um, like they might understand climate change, but it's so, it's so far removed from them. If you say this is going to you know, affect your children or your grandchildren, um, that's very different from something if you're smoking and it's affecting your ability to walk upstairs because you can feel that right now and when you stop smoking you can feel that you feel better. But with climate change, um, unless there's something around you um, right now, actually there's one thing, I was just recently at the World Social Marketing Conference in Washington um, and, uh, and there was a, a, a fellow social marketer who has been working with local weather forecasters and he's been getting them on board to report sort of climate change related information 
that affects the, the local community. So, and, and he gives, he actually gives them the information, like this is the number, this is the amount of rain that you had, you know, over the past 20 years. So you kind of draw your own conclusions. He's, they're not stuffing it down your throat. They're just quickly presenting the information and hey, look, this is, you know, the fifth flood we've had this year and we haven't had, you know, um, that many floods since, I don't know, 1908 or something. So that is apparently really having um, an important impact locally because they can, they can see sort of how it affects them. Um, and, that, and that's what we need to do as well. It's just like the Arctic ice flows, like I said before, it's so, it's so far, it's ho so hard for us to imagine what that's like if you're not actually there. But there's, again, there's no magic bullet, but <laughs> um, hopefully if we, and I started to see that on the World Environment Day, I was looking through all the posts of Greenpeace and so forth, and I, I feel like they're starting to change the tone of their message that it's not as, as negative as it has been in the past. So hopefully we're on the right track. Thank you. I'm um, not 100% sure that it, it would have worked, but I think it should have been tried. So for example, the Places to Grow Act. Very, very divisive fight between developers and municipalities and all that. I would argue that the province, when they presented that act, when they did that, they should have had metrics that they would say, this is what we're going to publish every year in terms of how many houses were built, what's the size, what's the density. A clear set of metrics that was agreed to when it was published. Same with, with WDO and now RIPRA there should be an agreement on what data will be presented, how much will it cost, how much has been diverted, that we cannot argue about the, like everybody agrees that this data is credible and you don't argue about it. And I, I see this happening in climate change is the two things that are driving much of the discussion now is the Keeling curve, because it's, it's got 65 years of history and nobody argues whether the numbers are right. They say, okay, that, that's what it really is. You can argue about what it means. And then the other one is insurance claims. The, the insurance industry of Canada has now started to publish every year what is the cost of, of claims that are climate related. They don't say it's because of climate change or whatever, they just say here's the number. And I think you end up with a, Obviously, it's not going to be 100% effective, but I think it's, it's part of, of the answer is, is credible metrics with any piece of legislation or whatever, trying to get some of this taken out of the, out of the process, maybe. If we've got no more questions, then please join me in thanking our panel, Daniel Hornweg, Sarah Lindsay, and Jennifer Lyons.